In 1977, the television series Roots premiered. Now, at the time, I was only four years old, but I can still remember the energy, that cultural buzz around the series based on the novel by Alex Haley that traced the saga of Kunta Kinte's family from their capture in Africa, through slavery, all the way to freedom. And I can remember people were talking about this series. I remember my mother had read the book and I remember every night it was on, my parents and I sat in front of the television and watched all the episodes together. Now, for those of you who have watched this series starring LeVar Burton, the recently deceased Cicely Tyson, Maya Angelou, Ben Vereen, John Amos, and many other famous actors, you might think the series was too mature or intense at times for a young viewer. Something you might not be able to tell by looking at me is that not all of my extended family members are white and my parents wanted to expose me to as much diversity as they could because that's just part of the family. They were also vigilant about helping me through traumatic scenes by explaining them to me in ways my four-year-old self could understand. One of the scenes that I remember to this day is the tragic whipping scene when Kunta Kinte was brutally whipped in front of all the other people on the plantation because he refused to accept the name that the white slave owner gave him. It, it was a brutal scene with the, the white overseer yelling the name that the owner wanted and Kunta boldly saying every time he was whipped, my name is Kunta Kinte. Eventually his spirit was broken and he accepted the name of slavery. My parents could tell I was upset by this scene and my mother helped me understand it by saying this to me. Do you know why it hurts so much to see what happened to Kunta? Because he was degraded. He was not respected for who and what he really is. What happened to him was dehumanizing. It was treating him as less than a person, less than a human being. It hurts to see that happen. It's okay to feel bad. Did you see the white man who whipped Kunta? He dehumanized another human being. And that, that made him a monster. That is why slavery is not only wrong, it is evil. Because it makes everyone who believes in it and practices it, practices it less than they can be. It makes them less than human. Slavery is dehumanizing to everyone. This lesson helped me understand the other atrocities in the series for what they are and has stayed with me to this day. My mother's lesson, given probably during a commercial break in 1977, has helped me understand the importance of recognizing and naming evil as the opposite of the healing liberation Jesus exemplified in today's gospel reading as part of how I practice the way of love and how I follow Jesus. Now, today's gospel from, Mar uh, from Mark's gospel might make some folks uncomfortable because it's one of the stories of Jesus exercising what the author of Mark's gospel called an unclean spirit. Unfortunately, often well-meaning interpreters, commentators, and even scholars sometimes interpret this and other exorcisms that Jesus performed by putting down the people of Jesus's day, insisting that they were superstitious and didn't understand things like mental illness and therefore any story involving things like unclean spirits or demons were just how those poor, uninformed and unenlightened people of Jesus's day explained mental illness. Some commentators have gone so far as to try to diagnose the illness. And as well-intentioned as such interpretations might be, it's unfortunate. Those interpretations fail to see the damage that they can do to people who really are suffering from mental illness and have nothing in common whatsoever with those accounts in the Gospels. Unfortunately, these misinterpretations can cause feelings of shame and further stigma for people dealing with their illnesses and for their families.
And such interpretations are the opposite of what the gospel writers intended to reveal the holy, healing, liberating love of God personified in Jesus. Perhaps the reason for the misinterpretation is the discomfort with identifying unclean or evil spirits and associating such behavior as embarrassingly uneducated. There is the idea that evil simply does not exist and anything called evil can be explained as something else. The trouble with this idea is that it can be used to justify belittling or dehumanizing our fellow human beings simply for being different. People who struggle with mental illness are not the same as what Jesus encountered in today's gospel. There can and should not be any comparison ever. See, the man with the unclean spirit was someone who brought his unclean spirit, whether it was his hatred, some long, unhealed spiritual or emotional wound that had festered until it became, you know, revenge or something worse, or whatever evil had enslaved him into making him less than he could be. He brought that with him into the synagogue that day. And it's fascinating to me that this unclean spirit recognized Jesus for who he is before anyone else, even Jesus's disciples. And the unclean spirit called out Jesus's name. Scholars like Ched Myers claims this is serious and an important detail. The unclean spirit was trying to enslave or exert its power over Jesus by calling him by his name. You see, naming was as important a practice in ancient times as it is today. Naming is about power, having power over someone, or claiming power, which is why slave owners wouldn't let people keep their own names. It was proof of ownership. And that is why once they were free, former slaves chose new names for themselves. On the other hand, naming a problem or situation is the first step to improving it instead of letting that situation have power over you. That could explain why Jesus told the unclean spirit to be silent. He refused to give it power or authority over him, and instead he cast it away. And by doing so, he healed the person who'd been afflicted and freed him from whatever had been getting in the way of being close to God and to his neighbors. And although we might be uncomfortable admitting it, we, and because we live in different times, there are still unclean spirits among us. If we learn how to identify them, how to name them, like my mother taught me, we might be able to prevent them from having power over us. These are ideals, beliefs, mythologies that are contrary to the belief that all people are made in God's image and therefore loved and valued by God, who desires for us to live free from the oppression that prohibits us from feeling God's love and loving God and loving others. Today, we call these unclean spirits slavery, racism, sexism, misogyny, white supremacy, Christian nationalism, ageism, anything that promotes any sort of tribalism, now, tribalism isn't about belonging. Tribalism is the belief that one group is superior to all others and therefore is deserving of special treatment and privilege. So it's anything that promotes that belief of privilege over the common good. Any belief rooted in dehumanizing anyone who is different or justifies seeing people as just being less than people. And as history and current events reveal, all of these unclean spirits have attempted to co-opt Jesus and name him as the authority of their belief. But today's gospel reveals Jesus has nothing to do with these things. They are not any authority he endorses nor claims. Instead, it is clearly articulated in today's gospel that Jesus has power over all unclean spirits, and that means for those of us who follow Jesus, no matter how tempting or terrifying such unclean spirits are, we can and are free 
to completely reject them. They have no power. They have no authority over us. Our power, our authority comes from Jesus. It frees us from that tribalism, from the belittling behavior of labeling individuals as winners or losers, and frees us to truly love our neighbors, our LGBTQ plus neighbors, our black neighbors, our Republican neighbors, our Democrat neighbors, our independent neighbors, our unemployed neighbors, our brown and Latino neighbors, our Jewish neighbors, our Muslim neighbors, anyone who looks or thinks or believes differently or has a different religion. Just as that old hymn says, all the children in the world are precious in Jesus's sight and therefore they are precious in ours as well. Believing in Jesus's authority means we are free to reject all those unclean spirits, but that does not mean that Jesus frees us to do whatever we want. Jesus didn't die and rise again so that we could just be selfish, but so that we could be free to live that way of love of God. That's not a program. It's a way of life. One where we do what we can to show respect and treat all people with dignity. Sometimes that means going beyond charity to work towards societal change, systemic change to eradicate poverty. Right now, it means following the guidelines and mandates intended to slow the spread of the COVID-19 virus until at least 70% of the world's, not Athens County, not Ohio, but the world's population has been successfully vaccinated. Other times following the way of love is listening to the person who disagrees with us in a way that makes them feel heard. Not agreeing with them, not debating them, but letting them know you hear what they are saying. In a podcast I listened to, I recently heard about a Muslim woman who was verbally abused on social media by several members of a white supremacy group. The woman's surprisingly loving response to the abuse was to answer their hurtful comments in ways that shows that she heard them, she understood where they were coming from, she acknowledged and helped them name the personal pain behind their anger and prejudice. This was so unexpected, it ended up being transformative for the members of the white supremacy group. It made them reflect on the experience of being heard by someone so very different from them and the unclean spirit of white supremacy they had given themselves to and the deep sorrow that had led them to that faulty belief system. The experience caused them to leave the white supremacy group because it was dehumanizing to a person, to a fellow human being whose name they knew and they called a friend. That is the healing power of the love of God, Jesus frees all of us to embody. That is loving our neighbors and letting that liberating love heal people and free them from those unclean spirits that keep them trapped in fear and anger that they can be afraid to name. And even though it isn't always easy to do or live into, it is empowering and hopeful and just knowing that it's true, just knowing that it's real, knowing that it has already happened and that it can and will happen again.